Okay, good evening. Hello. We'll call this meeting to order. It's a regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen for August 9th. I'll ask anyone who's not speaking to put yourself on, on mute, but we'll um, begin as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. For a public audience, we have two emails. Um, now that we're back in this virtual format, you can um, send your uh, written correspondence to the email address townmanager at simsbury-ct.gov to be read into the record. Uh, you can also uh, send an email to that same email address um, if you'd like to um, join our meeting um, via Zoom to address the board. Um, the first uh, letter we have is from uh, Joan Poe. Now that marijuana is legal to use and grow, what is the town's position on marijuana use on town property? According to the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center, PAC ticket information, it states, strictly prohibited on the grounds, smoking, hard liquor, drugs, ball playing or other sports equipment, pets, fireworks, sprinklers, uh, firearms or any other incendiary device, radios, boom boxes or other stereo equipment, solicitation or unauthorized concessions or handouts, tents, tarps and large tables, lewdness, drunkenness or other inappropriate behavior. Audio and video recording and flash photography are prohibited during the performance. What is the town's position on the use of marijuana on town property during PAC concerts? Why is there no signage at the entrance? How will the management of the PAC enforce their regulations? Recently, there was an article in the Hartford Current about allowing a cottage industry of chefs baking and selling products from their home kitchen. Caitlin Kresselt of the State Department of Consumer Protection said cottage applicants must fulfill several requirements before license approval. They have to get permission from their town. If they are on a well, they need uh, their water tested from within three months or a copy of their water bill. They must uh, complete food safety handler courses. Are the entrepreneurs allowed to lace their products with homegrown marijuana for sale? What is the town's position on these cottage industries? What is the town's position on recreational products? On May 9th, 2019, Sergeant Trombley, Trombley was terminated for untruthfulness. Through the investigation, Chief Bolter compelled union officials to disclose privileged confidential communication under threat of disciplinary action and direct violation of Connecticut law. Chief Bolter appointed himself investigator and prosecutor in the internal affairs investigation of a rumor that Sergeant Trombley was discussing and recorded a conversation where it's alleged that Chief Bolter said he would like to have some officers leave the department. Chief Bolter has never admitted to the rumor of what he said. On October 25th, 2019, Ed Kaczynski, IVPO national representative, wrote an email to town manager Maria Capriola stating, I'm writing to you on behalf of the IVPO Local 458. It's our stance that, that during the termination hearing of Sergeant Trombley, Chief Bolter was untruthful in his testimony, which was provided under oath and penalty of perjury. Town manager Maria Capriola responded, quote, the commission is the decision, uh, is the decision maker in the matter in that case, although she is in charge of personnel. 80% of the Simsbury Police Union voted no confidence in Chief Nicholas Bolter on November 1, 2019. Pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act, I asked all entries on the police discipline log to the present. The last entry was October 20th, 2020. Why has Chief Bolter eliminated the process of writing entries in the discipline log since October 2020? These are some of the entries on the police discipline log. 2009 Sergeant Sagan's suspension mistreated arrestee 2020 counseling for emergency driving attributed to incidents 20-1291 and 19-42635. According to the police records 20-1291, it's alleged that this was an incident of a cop's visit where another officer went to the call. I asked Chief Bolter to respond to my allegations but have not received a call. It appears that Chief Bolter, who considers himself perfect, made a mistake. As Chief Bolter made mistakes on reports that are substantive and or changed slash corrected other reports. Recently, I had a conversation with Chief Bolter about Sergeant Sagan receiving his approval for owning a renovation business. I was told to mind my own business. Then Chief Bolter stated he had approved his request. 
I am awaiting the town to fulfill my FOI request for the approval. 2015, Sergeant uh, Thebault was uh, counseled for disobedience of orders, 2015 training for pursuit, 2016 training, taser discharge and report room. Officer Gray, 2019 counseling uh, Miss Door during a search. Officer Gray and several officers were going to a police convention. The officers were ready to board the plane when Officer Gray was allegedly arrested at Bradley Airport for placing a gun in his luggage without having it permitted. The officers left without him. Officer Gray took the next plane to join them. An email was sent to the town manager, Maria Capriola from Ed Kaczynski stating, Chief Bolter has conducted an internal investigation into an incident involving Officer Gray at Bradley International Airport. However, it was not listed on the log. The response I received on my FOI request from the town was that there is no documentation of the incident at the airport. Why did Officer Gray get a pass? It appears that Chief Bolter has abused, abused his power with selective enforcement and has not lived up to the standards he has applied to others. Can Chief Bolter continue in his leadership position when, <clears throat> when the rank and file have no confidence in his management of the Simsbury Police Department? All of my comments will be posted on Simsbury Patch, Twitter, at Joan Co and on uh, Facebook. Um, this final uh, letter comes from uh, Jennifer Smolnick. The domestic cat, although a wonderful pet, is a major threat to birds and other wildlife if allowed to roam. According to figures provided by the American Bird Conservancy, the number of domestic cats have tripled in the last 40 years. The American Bird Conservancy states that over 100 million roaming, feral, and outdoor cats have killed an unsustainable number of birds and are contributing greatly to the decline of many species in the U.S. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology cites an article in the journal Science saying, the first ever comprehensive assessment of net population changes in the U.S. and Canada reveals across the board declines that scientists call staggering. All told, the North American bird population is down by 2.9% billion breeding adults with devastating losses among birds in every biome. Domestic cats are not native. The early colonists introduced them to the new world. Our birds and other wildlife have not co-evolved with cats. Problem, the number of cats roaming at large through my yard and neighboring yards has become greater, especially in the last few years. I see them passing through my yard, especially at dusk and find them stalking in my gardens, bushes and around the perimeter of my property. I see them hit by cars on adjacent roads, and some do not appear to be in great shape. I chase these cats out of my yard, but they always return. I have buried a number of birds that are clearly victims of cat kills, including a handful of robins and cardinals, as well as small mammals, including chipmunks and white-footed mice. I have tracked down some owners and asked if they would keep their cats inside in a catico or a leash if the cats like to be outdoors, but no avail. One neighbor who keeps his cat on a leash and walks the cat outdoors complained to me that a free roaming cat had killed two young fledglings in his backyard. So I know and I share this problem with others in the neighborhood. In the time I've lived in Simsbury since 2011, I've seen more open land being developed and more houses and apartments being erected. An increase in development brings more likelihood of free roaming cats that continue to prey on existing wildlife. I can only see this problem getting worse, not better in the coming years. What are my rights as a property owner who does not want to see free roaming cats on my property? And what about the rights of wildlife who don't have a voice? Possible solution. One way to tackle this growing problem is to consider a leash law for cats similar to the one that's in place in the community for dogs. Here are examples of some ordinances that have cat and other animal leash laws. Portsmouth, Rhode Island, section 3-1, leash laws, section 3-6. It shall be unlawful for any person to allow or permit any animal to trespass on private or public property so as to damage or destroy any property or thing of value, and the same is hereby declared to be a nuisance. Portsmouth, Rhode Island also has a cat identification program, identification meaning any traceable form of identification such as a collar or hanging tag or microchip or cat license. Henderson, Nevada, Henderson Municipal Code 7.08.02, Animals at Large. It shall be unlawful for any person having charge, custody, or control of any animal to permit the same to be at large or trespass on the private premises of another or to be any, on any public highway, street, alley, court, public ground, or unfenced lot. All animals must be confined to the owner's property or shall be on a leash when on any public property, any highway, street, alley, 
court, uh, park, public ground, fenced lot, or wash. Leash requirements do not apply to designated enclosed areas of animal parks or animals participating in sanctioned performance events. In addition, the following is included on the Henderson website. Wonder what to do about your neighbor's cat that's allowed to roam freely? We loan humane traps out for 10 day increments, weather permitting. Once a cat has been trapped, you can notify animal control and an officer will pick up the cat or you can bring the trap and cat to our facility. Let's keep birds and other wildlife safe in our town. Let's implement this simple measure so that our children and grandchildren can enjoy the beauty and benefit of our native birds and other wildlife. Remember, extinction is forever. Um, those are the two uh, emails that we received that I'm aware of. I just wanted to make sure there was no other public audience that we have tonight. Okay. Then we will continue to our first of two presentations. Um, the first is from our Economic Development Commission. The EDC has been working with the Simsbury Main Street Partnership on a refresh of the town's marketing and branding materials. Uh, special thanks to Brooke Freeman and Charmaine Seavey, who's been leading this project from the EDC, and Sarah Nielsen, Executive Director of our Main Street Partnership, and uh, Jeff Dornenberg, whose firm has been hired to assist the town um, with this project. So I will uh, turn it over to that group. Thank you all for being with us tonight. So first of all, thank you guys very much for having us. Uh, we're going to be brief because I promised Mike Payne that we wouldn't we wouldn't go too long tonight. Um, anyway, just to refresh both the Board of Selectmen as well as the viewers at home. In 2006, the Simsbury Main Street Partnership in concert with the town of Simsbury uh, became a Preserve America community. That is a federal National Park Service designation. And the reason we did it, besides the prestige, uh, there's only four communities in the state, uh, but the re real reason we did it besides the prestige was it opened up grant money. So in 2007, we put together between federal, state, and local grants, we put together, together a $100,000 grant package. And we did this to create Simsbury's first real branding campaign. And we had the good fortune, and I think the good sense, to hire Jeff Dornenberg. It was a nationally competitive process. We had like 36 uh, RFPs from all over the country. I had never met Jeff Dornenberg, even though he was a resident. And I tell people, I'm gonna be honest, that he was a resident almost played against him, but he was just so talented. And so we hired Jeff and we began a community-wide community building process to create a brand. And we know the brand worked because we had one unified voice and we started marketing ourselves nationally and we got national exposure, National Geographic. We had over 100,000 hits from our Preserve America campaign in the first four weeks of tracking. And so that's, you know, about a year and a half, two years later is when Simsbury started showing up on CNN and CNN Money Magazine's best places to live. So about four years ago, I went back to the Board of Selectmen, uh, maybe four or five years ago, and I said, listen, you know, we'd like to do a refresh of the brand. And the Selectmen at that time, the sitting Selectmen, were good enough to approve the money. Um, we had a switch of town planners, and when we did, the money wasn't properly allocated. And so we lost those funds. So in 2020, I went back before the Board of Selectmen uh, with the help of our town manager, Maria Capriola, and her team. Um, and you guys unanimously approved the branding. Um, I'm going to let Jeff take us through because, you know, the reason we're doing this, it's a very quick update, but we haven't been before you guys in a little bit. We've been working on this diligently. Um, COVID did slow us down quite a bit, but we're back up, we're running, and we're working on this very very closely. Um, and we have some exciting survey results that not only tell about uh, the branding, but I think are really important to the leaders like the Board of Selectmen in the community. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. He's just going to do a quick update on the survey. Um, but I want to point out one thing. We have a phenomenal deal with Jeff Dornenberg. We got him for beyond dirt cheap. And I want people to understand that, okay? You guys are paying less than $18,000. And that includes printing. And the reason we were able to do this is because Jeff and I consistently trade favors back and forth. I think that's number one. So he owed me, now I owe him and, and it's even. Um, but because we've already put in more than $100,000 into this campaign, we have an existing relationship, we're ready to update. There's so many things that have changed between 
you know, 13, 14 years ago and now, but we are getting him for the most phenomenal price. It is, and Charmaine can really, being in that field, can attribute it. As Eric mentioned, I'd like to thank Charmaine and Brooke. Um, when I went to Maria and Eric, and at that point, Sherry Cook, a couple, you know, when they were forming the EDC, I said, listen, wouldn't this be a great project? I'd love to see EDC come on and, and do this new project with this new commission. So it all worked out very well. I think we're on a phenomenal track. We've gotten great feedback. We've had focus groups with hospitality, um, both restaurant retail, um, sorry, restaurants, hoteliers, as well as our local realtors and uh, construction people. So with that, I'm gonna let Jeff take you through the survey results. Thank you, Sarah. It's a tough act to follow. Um, you're always too kind. Um, let me see, uh, let me try and share my screen so that I can walk through this. It's not. Don't go make me go back on my word to Mike. Yeah, 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 I know. It's just um, not showing up when I want to share my screen. Well, it's, it, Sarah, as there's some dead time here, Chris Peterson speaking, I'll just attest to what, what a fine gentleman Jeff Dornberg is. I'm glad that we're getting him at a fantastic uh, value because uh, Jeff and, and another pain whose name shall not go fully revealed has taken plenty of money out of my pocket to golf <laughs> matches. So that's, I'm glad we're having Yes, like I said, and Charmaine, um, oh, here we go. You know, Charmaine being in the field, I think was a really fantastic resource to be able to say, you know, again, because um, the other thing I should mention actually is so Main Street officially owns the brand. There has to be an owner. Main Street owns the brand, but through our partnership with the town of Simsbury and working with Maria, uh, we licensed the brand out to the town of Simsbury. So everything that is created and everything that was created in the past has been able to be used by the town of Simsbury and will continue to be used by us. Take it away, Jeff. All right, we ran this for a couple of weeks at the end of last spring. Um, most of our uh, responses came uh, very early. Um, as Sarah said, we're trying to um, work on a new brand. We're trying to refresh the brand. And we want to grow interest in Simsbury as a, a place to visit, a place to work, a place to live, a place to own a business. Um, a strong brand message can help create a common vision in the community. It's really about trying to find a singular voice trying to find the words that people can use that not only are aspirational and make people attracted to you, um, but are true. What's really important about a brand is that when you experience the brand, in this case, visiting Simsbury, it matches what you've heard. If there's a disconnect there, it, it only does damage. So we met before we put this survey out, we met with, uh, Sarah organized a meeting with um, folks from around town in the hospitality business. And one of the things that came up there was that um, a lot of millennials, a lot of younger people are coming to town and they're coming for biking, hiking, river, and they're staying overnight and they're making a weekend out of it. Um, there's a lot of talk about whether this is a COVID thing and whether it will last, a lot of things are gonna last after COVID. So we, we thought that was pretty good, but we need to test it because we're all in the woods here. Um, I'm involved in a lot of stuff in town. You guys are involved in a lot of things in town. And you just need to test to make sure that what you see is real, not just what you think you see. And you'll see when we get to the end of this, there's a little bit of that. Who replied 831 responses, um, 68 percent, 45 plus. A lot of were a lot of our respondents were 50 plus, 70 percent female, 60 percent household income over hundred thousand dollars. That's not a statistic; it's reflective of America in general, but it is a reflective of Simsbury. 93 percent of the people that responded to us were residents. Um, that's not too surprising because residents take an interest in the town, so they would tend to stop and respond to something like this. 
50% uh, of our residents were 15 years or more. 70% um, 70, 70%, and this is whether they're a visitor or whether they're a resident, come from Connecticut, New York, or New England. And most of the people that visit Simsbury, most of the people that move to Simsbury come from Connecticut. 68% eat out weekly. Um, they see great value in the, um, in the library and they've attended uh, Talcott Mountain Music Festival. So these people get out. What first attracted you to Simsbury? This, this is the part that, that um, I, I just love this, that the small town vibe, outdoor activity, when we get to other, that's a lot of uh, family uh, work. There's a few specific things in there, but it's a lot of family and work. And then beauty, um, which I think is, um, is, a, is a strongly recurring theme. Um, residents, uh, public schools, of course, always when you move here, um, public schools are a big deal. Again, though, the small town vibe, the beauty, the outdoor activities, very strong responses. What brings you back to Simsbury? This is great. Um, restaurants. Uh, for those of you who have been in Simsbury for 15 plus years, you remember a time when Simsbury actually didn't have restaurants or had very few. I will get in trouble if I say not. Had very few. Um, so they come back for the restaurants. We have a lot of great restaurants now. But again, it's this outdoor activity small town vibe and beauty. And when I say, and when we get to other, it's still family and work, but then people list out the outdoor activities. Residents, beauty, small town vibe, safety appears uh, now, outdoor activities. Schools drop from the top to the bottom, but if you look at the age of the people who replied, most of their kids are probably out of school now. So it's not where they live and breathe. Whereas when you have little kids, you really live and breathe in the schools. Do you participate in outdoor activities? From a town management standpoint, this is lovely. They walk on the paths, which is the first one. They, they like to hike on the trails that are already there. And then the other people walk or ride or jog on, on the streets. This is great because people are make, they're using the facilities that are already in place, um, which is great. And it also makes you feel good about having committed the resources to the facilities that are in place because they're being used. Residents, the same thing, walking, jogging, um, hiking, big deal. This, all these, to these top four areas are, they're, all attractions that already exist and people are using them. Simsbury uh, parks, uh, trails, rivers provide a great outdoor. Look at it. I, this is usually strongly agree and somewhat agree, you kind of lump together. In, in these cases, we're up 90 in the 90 percentiles, which is uh, pretty much pretty much as close as you get to 100 percent. And then uh, I don't know if I've ever seen this in a survey before, but the Simsbury is a safe community. The third question down visitors it was 100 percent. I don't, I don't know if <laughs> again, I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, anyway, great place to raise kids. Everybody seems to agree with that. Um, Simsbury's Performing Arts Center is a Tremendous asset to the community. I wonder why I put that question in. Yes, of course it is. Uh, Simsbury Public Schools are good. Yes, everybody agrees. Simsbury has a unique combination of small town character and suburban convenience. These are very high scores too. And the thing is, you won't be surprised by that from what you've already seen where the small town vibe, people answer the same question when it's asked a different way and they answer it um, just as consistently. We drop a little bit on a nice mix of dining, shopping, and recreational activities, but it's still incredibly high. Um, Simsbury's friendly and welcoming to the community. 
we drop a, a little bit here. But again, when you think about this, this is these are in the 80s, right? Um, high 70s and 80s. So it's still a very positive response. Although we might want to actively try to work on how to make that a little bit stronger. Seems very cares about community, uh, about quality of life and arts and culture. Still strong, although these are going in dropping order. Seems very cares about the environment. That's also very high, continues to be very high when you pull these together. Um, Seems very cares deeply about community, volunteerism and social justice. I think the social justice part of this threw this out. In retrospect, I wish I'd put that in a separate question because Simsbury lives and breathes on volunteers and people who live here know that. Simsbury is a great place for an active retirement. This is funny that these, that these numbers um, dropped, although I think they're related to the affordability question because the thing that people do outdoors is walk, which is great for retirement. Simsbury is a great place to start a business. Again, they dropped, although most people, there were a lot of neutrals in this because most people don't really think about starting a business. They don't, it's not actively on their mind except for people who start a lot of start businesses. Um, and Simsbury offers a range of housing options. Um, this I think we could work on because there's a great misconception about what it costs to move into Simsbury. And um, I held that too. I moved to Southwick when I got a job in Simsbury until I realized that I could afford a house in Simsbury and then moved here and have lived here ever since. But when I took first took my job at, at the Hartford, I didn't think I could afford to live here and found out later that I could. There's a, so this is, this is one of those things that I think we could work on. Um, Simsbury is a diverse community, Yes, we begin to fall, our numbers begin to fall. Seems very uh, affordable. Yes, we're starting to fall even more, recognizing the property tax issue. Although when people live in a town, they often don't recognize that people in similar towns are paying the same property tax. So yeah, I'm not too surprised by that. Simsbury is a great place for recent graduates and young professionals. This is interesting because some, this is an example I think of sometimes when the actual brand gets out ahead of the perception of the brand, because at the same time people were responding to this, state of Connecticut ha was uh, developing a website targeted at millennials and the seven towns that they chose to put in this was one of them was Simsbury. So, Again, you go back to the age of the folks who were filling out our survey and they were, they were parents who believed that their children couldn't afford to start out here, that it wasn't the best place for their children. And yet we're beginning to see more and more young people moving to town where the brand is getting ahead of our perception of the brand, which is again, why we ask questions, why we, why we try to look at these things to, um, to figure out where the work needs to be. In anything we do, we only have a few words or a few sentences to make our point. So it's important to, have to know where those weak spots are. And then when we ask people to put into their own words how they felt about Simsbury, whether, and this is combined from the residents and the visitors, because the, the answers were so similar. This idea of community, comfortable, the small town, quaint, friendly, that kind of thing, the safe and beautiful, um, beautiful came up time and time again. So when we think about changing out the lights on Main Street, putting in sidewalks on Main Street, thank goodness Andy's is gonna be full now, not having holes in, in our town. Um, uh, the renovations to Fitzgerald's, the, the ongoing work, the, uh, the, the flower uh, bridge, that, that now that's a, it's a park and, and it's constantly, every, every parking place is, is taken every time I go, go there. It's just, it's, it's wonderful. But this is how, this is how our respondents um, spoke about the town. Um, so I think 
this is where we're going to work from to talk about how do we put a, our best foot forward for Simsbury. And the initial work that we're going to do will be used. Um, uh, it'll be used by realtors. It will be used um, at, at town hall. Um, and that's, that's going to be most, most it's sometimes recruiting, like for companies to have for recruitment, like what's my town look like? What's my town good for? It'll be used for things like that. Also so, used by our the Riverview and the Inns. Yes. So that's why Thank we you. had them sit at the table as well. They see tons and tons of guests that come through, tens of thousands of people that come through their doors that are either looking to then relocate or looking to explore and come back. And so um, we had them as major partners as well as the realtors. So, you know, that's really what we're looking at is that the, the tourism of uh, the visits, um, as well as letting the residents know all there is to offer in Simsbury and allowing them to become ambassadors for the town as well. So can I stop sharing or do you want me to keep it up? I think that's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay if you take it down, Jeff. Okay. Um, I've, I'll just love to hear what questions members of the board have. Um, I have a couple of my own. Um, with an exercise such as this, do you, you know, we, there's obviously some clear strengths on here. There's a couple of weaknesses. Do you just highlight the strengths and, and promote those? Or is it also a challenge to us about how do we improve those weaknesses? Do we focus on both ends? For my purposes, um, I'll strength. Uh, I'll focus on strengths uh, because, again, I have in anything that I make, I'm going to have just a few words or a few sentences to make to make the point. Um, with the exception of some of the communication around, you actually can't afford to live in Simsbury, even though you don't know it. But again, we want to be even careful with that because. Right now, Simsbury is perceived by, by some people out of town as an aspirational brand. So, you, you know, you just, you, we just have to dance a little bit carefully around that. But I don't think this is, my communications is not the place to fix the things that are broke. But our conversation about it in the building is an opportunity to do that. Sure. sure. And Eric? Right? The other thing is, so the, you know, we're, we're redoing the brand, which is step one, but that's never enough. Okay. You know, it's going to be great to have new marketing materials and updated materials and things, but then there's going to be other steps that are not included in this package that are going to be equally important. So for example, you know, we've been through Chris Peterson and Jackie Battos's work. They've kind of been talking about, um, Sims is more affordable than you think. Right. And we've been talking about how many, um, how much of our housing stock is like under 300,000 and under 250,000. And so through, um, and Maria and I and Mike Glidden have been talking about this as well. So there's an opportunity after we do the branding to start to tackle that. And, you know, again, Sims is more affordable than you think and, and remind people of the diverse housing and also the rental opportunities that we have. There's going to be an opportunity to talk about and, and flaunt that Sindri has actually become the place to do business in the Valley. We are, and many thanks to the town manager's office and our team, we are probably the top easiest place to do business in the Valley right now. And business owners know it. My developers know it. You know, we didn't lose that many businesses during COVID and the ones we lost, we replaced quickly. So, you know, Maria and I and Mike Lydon have been in talks again about, you know, do we do another package about that afterwards? So I think that the branding is going to be, to Jeff's point, we can only do so much. We have a limited time, but then there's going to be other steps that we're going to work on with you guys um, to create experiences, to do other things, um, and to really get the brand to to live. That's what you really need to do. It's not just about having a pretty picture. It's about backing it up. Yeah. It also gives you a foundation from which to speak, right? Because once you've determined uh, what your brand is going to be, are you on brand or off brand, right? When you, when right. you talk about things, when you try to solve these other problems. On the affordability piece, I was surprised how low that came out. It's just 7% strongly agreeing. And, you know, my, my feeling is that affordability is the eye of the beholder. And, you know, 
in Connecticut, perhaps we are less affordable, but in comparison to the metro areas who are north and south, we are highly affordable. And I'm just curious if there's an opportunity to, to uh, talk to people in, in those areas with that kind of a message. I, th I think that that has to be addressed because it's so far off from the reality. Um, part of what we want to do is to make sure to make a brand real. It has, when you experience it, it has to be true. Like we said, it, like I said at the beginning, but this issue of the incredible range of house prices that are available in Sibsbury, people just don't know that. And I think that that's a, that's just an education thing. And very quickly, the other nice thing is, uh, to your point, Eric, we found out before COVID, people were moving from, can anyone guess which town people were moving the most from to Simsbury? New York City. Chris, what? Which town? Co uh, oh, he Co froze. West Hartford. West Hartford, Chris got the gold yes. medal. People were moving from West Hartford because they considered Simsbury to be more affordable and you also got more property. So you got a bigger lawn. You, for families, you got more living space. Um, talking about, you know, it's all relative. People during COVID have been moving from New York and New Jersey. So again, to your point, um, it is affordable and it really does depend on your frame of reference because for New York, New Jersey, and even West Hartford, we are very affordable. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. What other questions does the board have tonight? I don't have a question. I just want to thank you guys because you did great work and the data, gosh, that helps us so much. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'll echo that. Wendy? Yeah, so I, I'm just going to weigh in here because later we're talking about the American Rescue Plan money and just listening to this presentation um, to me shows the importance of economic development in the downtown area and our businesses. And, you know, we do have a lot of um, restrictions on how we can use the money, but it makes me think that, you know, and I know Jackie feels the same way, and I think the rest of the board does too, that using the money where we can to keep up this brand, you know, and make us even better it is a good use of the funds. Wendy, Marie and I are already spending your money. Don't worry. No, I'm just teasing. But no, we have, to, to be honest, again, you know, I, I think one of the benefits of working so closely with the town manager's office and the team um, and the planning department is, you know, Afterwards, as we mentioned, there's a lot of pieces that I think we could come out of that that would do tourism, which is a hot, you know, that's the, the biggest buzzword for the ARPA money. Um, so tourism related materials. But then also um, our town planner, Mike Glidden, has a fantastic idea to do a development update. And I know Maria is like, we were so excited. So um, we're going to come back to you at a later date after you guys have agreed on the process and the criteria and everything. And we're going to be asking for uh, some of those funds to do some of these exciting projects. So we're already been thinking of that ahead. It just has to get by Amy. <laughs> I, we did talk with Amy as well. So I think we'll be okay. She is fantastic. She's going to audit all of us. She'll be talking later. Yes. Other so uh, Eric, real quick, um, if I can, um, I, I think this is great. I like that a number of my perceptions are what other people, both residents and visitors, perceive as doing things. I think this, this as, as Jeff really put very well, is explains how we need to educate both the visitors and the residents about a lot of the process and the affordability. I think it does point out some things we have to address, and that's what any good uh, questionnaire should show you, is areas where you can improve. And we should always have areas to improve. Otherwise, we're just sitting on our hands and we're going to get our, our uh, head handed to ourselves. So I really appreciate this. And Jeff uh, and uh, everybody else, uh, great job. Thank you. Thank you. I'll echo that. Uh, thanks. Have a good evening. Thanks for Thank your work. You Look forward to next steps. All right. Our second item. 
uh, under presentations, I'm just getting to my notes, is uh, Simsbury Pollinator Pathways uh, presentation and proclamation. Um, Simsbury Pollinator Pathways is a brand new nonprofit organization. I learned that they got their 501c3 status about two weeks ago. They have engaged and partnered with numerous organizations across Simsbury to promote um, sustainable practices when it comes to how we care for our natural environment. And they've approached the town um, looking for our support for us to sign on. Um, we have a brief presentation tonight um, followed by a uh, proclamation. And I wanted to turn it over to uh, Joe Campolita and uh, Nancy Grandin for the presentation. I think um, there. We don't hear you. How about now? It's yes. excellent. Okay, because no. I've got uh, there was there was a tech issue, so it's it's all good. But uh, yes, no. Yeah? Can you hear us? We can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> technology. So. <laughs> so we wanted to say thank you for the opportunity um, to present to you and also um, that you're taking our request to consider this pollinator um, to make Simsbury a pollinator friendly community um, through a proclamation. So we appreciate your time um, and the ability to um, present to you. Um, next slide, please. Need the next slide. Thank, yep. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So, uh, so a little bit about us. We are the Simsbury Pollinator Pathway. Um, we were founded in 2020. Um, we're an all volunteer organization. We have uh, 13 members on the board, all volunteers. They come from a, a variety of backgrounds uh, uh, who are all interested in uh, our mission. And uh, as Eric uh, had said um, recently, we received our uh, nonprofit status as a, as a 501c3 uh, recognized by the IRS. Um, our mission um, to, to provide information on uh, the importance of um, native plants, pollinators, uh, connected wildlife. Um, we're obviously uh, very concerned about um, the um, uh, decimation of the, of the pollinator populations, which you will see contains a lot of um, insects and other uh, animals other than just bees. And uh, our mission also is to provide guidance and educational opportunities and also to um, support with recess, uh, resources uh, for the residents um, and the businesses and um, the town um, so that we can um, create new um, uh, and, and increase current um, pollinator friendly spaces. Um, so, um, you know, we look forward to that. So uh, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Thank you. So the, the importance of a, a pollinator pathway um, is in response to what's happening environmentally now. Um, and so the question that you ask is, who would we need for a healthy ecosystem? Um, and I think a, a lot of the times we take for granted um, what these various things are doing, sort of not noticing that these things are going on. So um, in Simsbury, and it's interesting that Jeff was referencing um, in the environment and, and um, how important that is to both our visitors and to residents here. So noticing that Simsbury um, does have a population of these uh, animals, the birds, um, there are amphibians and reptiles, everybody on the list, um, as Joe mentioned, when you say pollinator, people instantly think a bee, a single bee. Um, and, and rather than, than that, there are um, actually, uh, Connecticut alone has over 300 native bees, um, which each one does, like, <laughs> they, each one has like a little job and it does different things, um, and, but they're all pollinators. Um, butterflies are pollinators. Of course, there's everybody's favorite, the monarch. Um, moths are pollinators as well. Um, there are some flies that are, beetles, wasps, etc. So all of the animals and, and the insects that are listed are there are part of a healthy ecosystem and they're all necessary for us to be able to 
um, have what we need and what the planet needs um, in order to um, be here and, um, and survive. So um, the next slide, please. So this is um, important to notice. So is what pollinators do for us. And um, the plate is representative of all of the things when, you know, everybody knows from high school biology, what the pollinators do. They go plant to plant and they um, take the pollen and, and then suddenly we have new plants and all of these things. So what you see, the plate is just a representation of the kind of thing that we depend on all of these pollinators for. Um, and you see in the, the bullets that, you know, one out of every three bites of our food depends on pollinators. 85% um, of the, the world's flowering plants depend on pollinators and two thirds of the world's crop depend on pollinators. So, um, you know, to see them in decline um, is concerning and um, something that needs to be addressed. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so the problem is, and you can see by the plate, without the pollinators, you know, here's all of the, the two thirds, everything that's disappeared. Um, so part of the problem with people recognizing that we need to do a better job of supporting pollinators is that the perception that all insects are bad, you know, that bees sting and um, that everything, you know, is, is out there is, is not a good thing, um, which is not the case. Um, they're, they're critical, all these insects and all the other wildlife play a critical role. Um, loss of habitat, unsustainable land practices, um, emphasis on lawns over the natural ecosystem, wholesale use of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides, um, and then the selection of using non-native plants over native plants. And I'll stop for a second to just quickly mention about native plants. Native plants are, are plants that have been here. They are part of the ecosystem. Um, and they have been here you know, for hundreds of years. And so what happens is the, the animals, in particular the insects, they develop a, a taste for the plants. This is what they respond to. So um, having things that come from another country or somewhere else, well, it's, it's sort of like for them, they're like, I'll even use the broccoli on the plate and apologies to people who love broccoli. But <laughs> if you had the choice between ice cream and broccoli, the majority of people would choose ice cream. <laughs> and to, to the, particularly, you know, the Talmetto ice cream that we have here. So the insects, the insects like Talmetto ice cream because it's, it's part of the ecosystem. So to them, that's what native plants are. That's why planting native plants and making them available is really important. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we're gonna, um, because people are very familiar, you know, the, the first thing they talk about when, um, if you say pollination, people go right to the bees. So we're gonna use bees as an example. Um, and as mentioned, again, um, Connecticut itself, just, it has 300 different species of native bees. Um, and what happens is if you look at the circles, so the assumption is on a lot of cases that, that the bees just fly all over the place and that's not true. There are different sized bees and they have different size ranges that they can fly. So if you look at where the small bees are, the average distance that they can fly is 300 feet. So the maximum that they can go is 900. So the outside that they can fly anywhere over a field of flowers is 900 feet. And then you go to another bee, which is a medium size, well, they can go a little bit further. And then the larger bees can go a little bit further. The problem becomes when there's not enough pollinate flowers and plants, the native plants for them to land on to do pollen. So if that things are broken up in between, the small bees, if there's not another circle from between 600 and 900 feet, they can't go anywhere. The next slide shows the center. This is Simsbury. This is a Google map of Simsbury. And you can see, um, if you can see the, the little blue circle and then the red circle and, and then the larger yellow circle. And you can see how some of them intersect, but not all of them do. So in order for the bees to survive, the blue circle has to overlap with another 
area of that has native plants pollinating flowers. And so if there's, if the circles don't overlap, then the bees can't go from place to place and there's not enough for them to feed on. They don't have enough ability. There's, they can't fly that far. So a, one of the things that we do with a pollinator pathway is take that into consideration and try to figure out how to connect the landscape so that the bees can survive. Next slide, please. This right here shows the difference. On the left, you see that it's a fragmented um, habitat so that you can see that there's houses that are separate and then there's two woodlands, but in between there's nothing that connects them. On the scenario B on the right hand side, it shows that if you can put them together by connecting them through a pathway, then that creates a healthier native habitat. Next slide. So this is, um, if you see the little bouncing parts of it, if you can picture that this is Simsbury, there's the center of town um, in the middle and then there's residences around them. So if there are uh, pollinator friendly spaces in, in those concentric circles by having people have a mailbox garden and then maybe the person who lives next door to them has a, a larger pollinator garden. And then on a municipal piece of land, there's wildflowers that have been planted. So if there are enough of those, which is called a pathway, it's a, it's a corridor, if there are enough of those, then those concentric circles where the bees are overlap enough so that they're, they don't have to go looking for food. There's always a source of food for them to jump from place to place. So that the larger the pathway, the more areas there are that are dedicated to supporting the pollinators, the healthier they are and the healthier we are. Next one, please. So everywhere is an opportunity to make a pollinator pathway because <clears throat> we can connect habitats through lots of different ways. Um, if you see the second picture in, it's, it's the bridge, right? That's the flower bridge. So the flower bridge has uh, um, around the ends are gardens and there's a lot of native plants that are in there. And I know that there were just plants that were put in um, by the garden club um, last year at the new park. There's also pollinator friendly flowers that are on the containers. So all of that enables the bees and the other insects to jump from place to place and find the pollen that they need. There are also nectar plants out there, which are the ones that attract the butterflies. So when you go to the bridge and you see the butterflies, you know that's, that they planted in either the containers or in, in the park area, there are nectar plants. So any place can serve for that. If somebody lives in a small house, um, they can um, just putting out a container of flowers um, if they don't have the ability to turn part of their yard into um, a, a pollinator space. Simply putting out a container of flowers makes a difference. Um, if people are able to do it on a, a wider basis, um, and actually uh, Wendy was just at our house the other day and, and saw that we've done some work in our backyard, um, which we're fortunate to live against the woodlands. And so we took advantage of that and we put a lot of native plants in and it looks a little bit more like um, the far left picture. That's not our yard, but that's kind of what it looks like. Lots of native plants around um, so that there's opportunities um, through a municipality to do this, um, you know, through um, around sports fields, around at, uh, at schools, um, you know, we have lots of open space in this town, which is wonderful. Um, a lot of those are left to go as they are. As a matter of fact, the, the, um, the triangle that's, um, you know, between Barndor Hills and on Firetown Road, that's a great pollinator space because it's, there are natural wildflowers that grow in there. And, and so that becomes a space where you see lots of birds and lots of insects and um, that kind of thing. So um, that, that there's always opportunity for us to do that. Next, please. Thank you. So when we started the pollinator pathway, um, we um, have re been reaching out to people and encouraging them to join the pathway. And 
what that means is simply that you've made a commitment to do your best to create pollinator spaces wherever you can in the land that you have. So these are a few of the people, um, and you might recognize some of them, um, who have bought one of our signs and have agreed to, to the best of their ability, um, make their, um, their yard uh, a pollinator friendly space through um, natural practices, not using pesticides, um, planting flowers um, for insects, planting shrubs, um, berry shrubs for the birds, um, just generally making a commitment to, to make their yard um, pollinator and environmentally friendly. Um, we also have been working with, which I didn't list here because we're sort of in process with them, um, but there are a number of organizations, um, several of our the religious organizations um, in the community who have made a commitment. Some have already started their gardens. Some are going to be starting gardens. Um, we are working with the Hissimsbury Historical Society on creating um, some significant uh, pollinator spaces there. There are some organizations that have been doing this even before we got started. Um, the, the, for example, the Courtyard Garden um, at Simsbury High School, um, they have a whole space that's been dedicated to uh, butterflies and, and they plant it appropriately for there. So the idea is continuing to grow these spaces, to continuing to encourage people to do this, continuing to give them resources to do so, so that they have the education to understand why this is important. They have support um, from people. We've been working at, you're probably familiar, I'm sure, with Marjorie Winters. Um, Marjorie is assisting us in terms of how to advise people and, and um, providing information so that, so that they can be successful at that. So understanding why it's important and then giving them the tools to be successful in creating these spaces um, you know, for in their own areas is uh, what we're about. Next one, please. So one of the reasons that we, we uh, submitted a, a proclamation um, to the town for consideration for this is that um, success in, in planting for pollinators, success for uh, uh, you know, understanding why native plants become important, success in understanding why um, you know, changing practices, um, you know, yard practices and, and environmental practices is important. It's if the town leads by example, then a significant difference is made because uh, th there are many other towns that are doing this kind of thing. Um, it's across Connecticut and, and across the United States. And actually Great Britain is a, a great example of this. They um, see their roadsides and you know, they have wildflowers and, and that kind of thing. So this is, this is nothing new. This is um, something that has been successful in many other places and people are recognizing this important. What is very important about this though is that, the, the, that a town, a municipality uh, endorses this and, and takes the lead and says, you know, we believe that this is a good thing. And again, going back to what Jeff was saying, you know, obviously to the residents and, and to visitors, um, you know, the environment is important and, and we, you know, we've made that commitment to beauty as well. Um, you know, looking at um, the flower bridge again is a, is a beautiful thing. And this, um, I think Lisa is, is, I saw her name on this call, she'd recognize this at the library. Um, they've put together some raised beds, um, which are filled with pollinator flowers. And Cindy Shanks came a few weeks ago and requested a sign for that. So. Um, that's something that people are seeing as they're visiting the library. It's visible from Hot Meadow Street. Um, so the idea is to continue to create a connected series of pollinator habitats. And again, as I said earlier, they can be large, they can be small, they can contain, you know, lots of different plants or shrubs, depending on, on what people want to do. But the, the overall, um, the overarching thing about this is that if the town communicates that this is important, that they're investing, as it says, in the future, and, and they're providing hope for a healthy planet, then, you know, that's a way to communicate to residents that this is something that they can do too, and that this is something the town deems important. Um, businesses, you know, will get on board, which is happening, or local organizations are happening. So an endorsement from the town of proclamation saying, you know, we believe that, that this is a very, very important thing um, is, is really um, 
a, a critical component to the success. Next one, please. There are also benefits to the town in doing this. Um, in addition to being setting a standard um, and uh, you know, saying to the residents and the businesses and actually to other towns, you know, set the example. Um, it also lowers costs. Um, using native plants, um, you know, you, seeding, as you can see, the, you know, the wildflower areas, doing practices like that, lower the costs of things. Because once you put in native plants, what you, um, you know, switch over from sort of ornamentals and, and that kind of thing, um, it, it makes, uh, it's much less expensive because these plants pretty much take care of themselves. Um, once they're established, they don't need the same kind of care as, as a, another kind of garden, or in some cases, even a lawn does. Um, and you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, and some discussion was had about a, a space like Meadowood. Um, that's the idea behind some of that, is you can see that you mow a path um, in between uh, taller flowers, and then it becomes another nature path that people can enjoy. Um, so it's, it is in the long run, it's, a, it's much less labor intensive, um, taking care of this uh, kind of environmental um, area does not require um, any intervention. Um, in some cases you mow once a year, um, but it doesn't require intensive care. It doesn't require uh, a lot of money to be poured into it um, in the long term. Um, it reduces maintenance um, because you just pretty much that's native plants have been here a long time and they do their thing. Um, it uses the budget money effectively. So whatever is in the budget, uh, for example, currently for um, maintenance and that kind of thing, it, it, it's a straight across, um, it's, it would be the same amount. There's no additional cost um, once you go forward with something like this. Um, it, 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 uh, it gives opportunities to redeploy the resources. So whereas somebody might be mowing on a weekly basis, that's not necessary. And, and someone who's been doing that can be deployed somewhere else for another need that the town might have. So it makes the maintenance and it makes the care of the town much more efficient. Um, it does increase carbon sequestration if there are large areas of, uh, of meadow. So there are huge environmental benefits. Um, it, it decreases runoff if you're not using pesticides, if you're not using that kind of thing. It, it increases the positive environmental act, impact and it decreases, um, you know, the negative. It, it can highlight uh, the town's commitment to sustainability. Again, going back to the presentation that Jeff made, that's what people are looking for. They're looking for beautiful areas to walk through. They're, they're looking for um, a town that's saying, you know, this is what we believe is... is uh, caring for the earth. So there's lots of benefits to do this, um, to doing this. It go beyond doing the right thing. There's also, it's just beautiful. I mean, it's just lovely um, when this is like this and imagine even, you know, walking down Hot Meadow Street and there's more areas like in front of the, the library and it becomes another pathway um, for, to go to the bridge. You know, there's another, if people love the bridge so much, well, we can increase that kind of beauty as well as provide these habitats for these um, important, you know, animals, birds, and, and the insects. So next slide. So this is, the, this is my final slide. And um, when I've given presentations like this, this is the one that I use in, in the end. Um, and it was taken, the photo was taken by a member of the Simsbury Camera Club. And it shows a mother cardinal um, who's feeding her baby with a berry from a native shrub. And I use this because she's doing something that's familiar to all of us. Um, she's caring for her family, um, which is what in the end for so many of us, however our family is configured, that's, that's what's important to us. And in order for her and in order for us and in order for her, all of the insects that I mentioned and the small mammals and, and everything else. And in order for us to care for the families, all of these families, there has to be a healthy environment to enable all of these families to survive. And the difference between the cardinal and the other 
animals and insects that I mentioned and humans is that we are the only ones who have the ability to positively or negatively impact the environment. We're the only ones who can make the choice to do the right thing and care for the planet, care for the, all of the families. And our request for Simsbury to declare itself a, a pollinator friendly community, that's the base of it, is that by doing that, Simsbury communicates that we care and that we're going to take steps to care for the environment, to care for all of these families and, and to provide a healthy ecosystem. And that the, what we want our impact on the environment to be is positive and healthy and caring. So thank you for your time. Nancy, thank you. And, um, you know, it's pretty remarkable. Um, I know you've only been an official organization for a couple of weeks, but um, you've been sort of uh, an organization for about four months and working at this much longer. And it's pretty cool to see the number of organizations around town that you've been able to engage uh, around this work. I wanted to open it up and see what questions members of the board have. I have a com couple of comments. Um, so I was a skeptic at first, I admit that, um, you know, just, I didn't know anything and I still don't know very much, but um, today the UN came out and said, we're in pretty much code red on the climate and that we're watch the Dixie fires burning and we see Greece burning and the flooding that's been going on. And so Nancy had said something to me when we took a little tour of her garden and it's basically, we're almost like one of the last vestiges of area that's not gonna hopefully burn to the ground or flood to the ground. And so whatever we can do here to keep things alive and moving is really critical. And um, I really think thought about that a lot, Nancy. So that's just one thing that I would just say to people here. And the other thing that you said was, you know, I, my husband's gonna still cut my lawn I'm going to tell you right now, but he's willing to do a garden because we have gardens um, and to put in natural plants and, and do what's needed to create something, a part of the pathway. So you don't have to give up everything to join the pathway. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? You know what I just, what I wanted to underline is that I see this proclamation. Um, it's, obviously a visionary document because it's talking about the kind of community that we want for our next generation. Um, and while it is non-binding, there is nothing in here um, that is anything that we're committing ourselves to. It really helps set a framework for policies that this and future, future boards um, can adopt to further this work. And I'm really struck by um, the idea that, um, you know, we often do things, you know, the town does things and I do things, we all do things by default because it's the way we've always done them. And this is showing us that there's another way of doing things that not only looks pretty good, but it also is good for the environment and in the long run, it'll save us money. Um, so I think about, for example, how labor intensive the berm on iron horse is to maintain. And if that were, for example, when, when that's eventually replaced, if that were a, a field of wildflowers or just native plants, it wouldn't require nearly the level of upkeep and maintenance that it has today. Yeah. Um, any other questions before I uh, introduce the motion? Okay. Is there a motion effective August 9th, uh, 2021 to endorse a proclamation in support of Simsbury's Pollinator Pathways Program? I'll make that motion. Second. I'll second. No, Jackie. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. And that motion carries. It passes unanimously. Um, thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Really, really. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. thank you. Thanks a lot, folks. <laughs> I am going to move on to my first selectman's report, and I wanted to begin 
um, by thanking uh, in advance uh, Wendy and Sean for their presentation this evening on the ARPA funds, which will be a little bit later in the meeting. Um, I'll be including a more detailed description in my report that will be emailed out tomorrow. And I'll also provide a link to that presentation that we're gonna be sharing tonight. The Board of Selectmen back in 2019 created a work group to craft an ordinance governing short-term rentals in Simsbury's. These are properties that are listed on sites such as Airbnb. The work group was tasked with researching and benchmarking how other communities regulate short-term rentals and prepare a draft ordinance for the Board of Selectmen. Uh, Chris Peterson and Jackie Battos are representing the Board of Selectmen on this work group. And their work was sidelined by the pandemic, but they have started meeting again. And a draft of the ordinance has been completed. And once it's reviewed by the town attorney, the Board of Selectmen will review it and will likely schedule a, uh, a hearing to get public input. I invite you to mark your calendars for September feast scheduled for September 10th and 11th at Simsbury Meadows. Uh, the event will have live music, food vendors, and a craft fair. It's hosted by the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center, the Simsbury Junior Women's Club, the Simsbury Grange, and the Simsbury Spirit Council. Due to the pandemic, Simsbury's 350th celebration has been reimagined and continues into 2021. It is scheduled to conclude on September 30th with a closing gala. Tickets, though, are not yet on sale as the location still needs to be finalized because of ever-changing COVID restrictions. Also, save the dates of September 18th and 25th. The town will be hosting two free outdoor movie nights at the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center. I'm told both movies will be space-themed. Um, also, 350th merchandise, including a Really neat commemorative, commemorative medallion are available for purchase at simsbury350.com. And I'll turn it over to Maria for the town manager's report. Hey, thanks, Eric. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. I was having a little bit of difficulty with my computer um, last week, so I just wanted, wanted to make sure. All right, so I'm starting off this evening with our coronavirus update. Um, some really good progress in terms of the vaccination numbers within our community. Um, among our residents who are eligible um, to receive the vaccine, so uh, currently um, that's people ages 12 and over, um, we have hit 90.5% of those um, residents have received at least their first dose of the vaccine, um, and 86% of those people are fully vaccinated. So again, really good vaccination numbers within the community. Um, when you include our overall resident population, which in, uh, includes children who are not yet eligible for the vaccination, um, about 73% of our population uh, have begun that vaccination process, with just under 70% being fully vaccinated. Um, within the manager's report, I also have breakdown by age group. Um, we are continuing to monitor the state's COVID alert system, and I had hoped uh, some number of weeks back that we would not need to report on these statistics anymore at our meetings, but unfortunately, um, we have returned to orange status on the uh, municipal alert system, which means that we have uh, uh, more than five uh, COVID cases per 100,000 residents, uh, but less than 10. Um, for the week ending July 24th, we had 12 new cases, uh, and for the week ending July 31st, we had eight new cases. Uh, my understanding from the health district is that amongst uh, all of those most recent new cases in the most recent week, uh, those were breakthrough cases uh, amongst vaccinated individuals. And our positivity rate for the week ending July 31st was 2.4%. Um, the health district is telling us that through their contact tracing efforts, they are seeing uh, out of state travel, uh, large gatherings and households sp uh, spread as the predominant sources of, of spread of the virus at this time. Um, if you were to take a look at our 10 towns that make up the Farmington Valley Health District, um, we would constitute moderate risk um, for levels of community transmission uh, based on uh, how the CDC is currently defining that. Um, within the manager's report, we do have a link for folks who are interested in, in checking the CDC website to see at any you know, point in time how our county is doing, how our state is doing, how the rest of the country is doing based on this uh, level of risk uh, system that they've developed. Um, in areas of uh, substantial transmission, the CDC is recommending uh, that everyone, including those individuals who are fully vaccinated, uh, return to wearing a face covering in public indoor settings to help uh, prevent the spread of the virus, particularly, particularly the Delta variant. 
Um, Hartford County, as well as the state of Connecticut, have reached that substantial risk as defined by the CDC. So the health district is asking us to help share some key points and information regarding this emerging uh, COVID, uh, COVID data. And they want folks to understand that the Delta variant is much more contagious than other virus strains, uh, spreading twice as easily from person to person. Uh, the Delta variant is now the predominant strain, representing more than 80% of the cases in the Northeast. Um, our area, as I mentioned, is seeing vaccine breakthrough cases. Um, however, most of these cases are experiencing mild symptoms as opposed to more severe symptoms that are requiring hospitalization. Um, almost all of the hospitalizations and deaths are occurring among unvaccinated individuals. And uh, again, they're just reiterating the fact that these breakthrough cases um, are contributing to additional spread, and particularly they're seeing this amongst households and, and group gatherings. They do want to remind folks, if you are experiencing any COVID-like symptoms, um, to please seek a COVID test regardless of vaccination status. Um, oftentimes, the COVID symptoms people are getting uh, seem very similar to a cold or to allergies or to flu. Um, so they're saying, please don't assume that it's allergies, of cold or flu, and to, to please uh, uh, get testing. Um, what we have been doing, uh, generally on a weekly basis, uh, we are receiving information from the state of Connecticut about vaccination, um, as well as uh, testing locations in our larger region. So we have taken that data and are basically looking at locations within about a 20 um, minute drive of Simsbury, and we are posting that information on our website. Um, if folks have trouble finding that, they can certainly reach out to uh, town manager at simsburyct.gov, uh, and I forgot the hyphen there, I apologize. Um, and we'll be happy to help direct them to that location on the website. So based on all of this information, um, effective today, we are now requiring our staff members and our patrons who are visiting uh, our municipal buildings when they are indoors at our municipal buildings. Um, we are requiring folks, regardless of vaccination status, to please wear a face covering again until uh, further notice. And uh, we have also enlisted the help of our volunteers um, who were making um, cloth face coverings for us. Um, they had donated just under 5,800 masks to us. Um, at this point in time, we have redistributed over 5,200 masks back to the community. Um, and again, since our supplies are running low and face coverings are now being required in many places again, um, our terrific volunteers are back to making face coverings. So we just, again, want to remind people if you need face coverings, if you live in town, if you're a business in town, if you work in town, please don't hesitate to reach out to our social services staff. Uh, we have a phone number in the manager's report. Um, we are happy to provide as many face coverings as you need. And lastly, on the virus update, our social services department is uh, continuing with their expanded food program, helping our residents experience food insecurity. At our most recent Tuesday program, they assisted 96 households uh, which included 21 homebound deliveries and 17 kid-friendly bags. Uh, moving on to department news and notes, engineering is just reporting a couple of projects um, that either the state or utility companies are working on in town. Um, there is a traffic signal replacement um, at Hot Meadow Street, Wilcox Street, and Library Lane that is expected to take a few weeks. And we do just want to uh, let folks know that there could be some traffic delays. We've also notified businesses in that area. And Aquarian uh, is doing a water main replacement project um, near Squadron Line Road, um, also additional water main replacements on Greta Lane, Weatherly Road, Oxyoke Drive, and Eagle Lane will be completed in later 2021. Um, we do again expect some very minor uh, traffic disruptions there as well. Um, and there's information uh, in terms of how someone can contact Aquarian if they have additional questions or concerns about that work. And um, from our library, just a reminder that the annual book sale will be held on September 25th and 26th at the Simsbury High School. Um, we are taking uh, donations at this time. Um, the don items we're taking through donation, as well as uh, the hours and days that we're accepting those, those donations are included in the report. And from Parks and Recreation, um, we are extending the Simsbury Farm school season by approximately one week. Um, some of you may know that the opening of school, it was announced a little while back that that was going to be delayed. So we are keeping the pools open through August 31st, um, giving our families in town some additional opportunities to enjoy the facility. And from our police department, uh, we have an appointment. Um, we are pleased to announce that we have hired Kyle Colby to fill a police officer vacancy. Uh, he has an associate's degree in criminal justice. He has served in the United States Marine Corps. 
and he's dedicated five years uh, as a police officer in the North Charleston, South Carolina Police Department. Uh, he relocated to Connecticut recently, and we are happy to have him on board. So welcome, Kyle. And another uh, appointment piece of, uh, piece of news, Brian Tulloop recently joined the public works team as a truck driver in our highway division. Um, he's previously worked for the city of Torrington and their public works department. So he comes to us with a lot of relevant experience. Um, he is now part of the team. He's been a great, uh, great member of the team and contributing all of his skills from his previous employment. So welcome, Brian. And from social services, I'm sorry, I have a long report tonight. I'm so sorry, this is what happens when we go a month without a meeting. <laughs> um, for social services, um, we are pleased to announce that we have been able to bring back the foot care clinics to the senior center beginning Tuesday, August 3rd. Um, we'll have additional clinics uh, available August 17th and August 24th. Uh, and how folks can register is through calling the senior center at 658-3273. And lastly, uh, an announcement from the town manager's office. Uh, due to favorable um, WAP and workers' compensation claims experience, along with KERMA's financial strength, and you may recall KERMA is our insurer for, for those uh, lines of business, um, the town and board of education have received a member equity distribution in the amount of $57,000. And we do have a breakdown between the town and board of ed LAP policies and workers' comp policies. This is, again, very good news to report there. And that concludes my report this evening. Hey, Maria. Hey, Maria. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I'm hearing an echo. I think that's better. Uh, under selectman action, uh, item A, tax refund requests. Is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to approve the presented tax refunds in the amount of $196,500.19 and to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the tax refunds? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Item B is um, a donation from the Simsbury Historical Society. Um, Melissa, I don't know if you have an image of this thing to put up on the screen, but it is a uh, really impressive um, eagle carved out of wood and painted. It is gorgeous. And um, perhaps I'll turn it over to uh, Maria to explain where this thing's going to be uh, displayed. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, so the hand-carved eagle will be displayed in town hall in our um, planning, engineering, um, IT office suite area. Um, it's a really neat piece of, of hand-carved art. It's also very large. So um, we were approached by the Historical Society some number of months ago, and it just took us a little bit of time to find a location that could accommodate uh, the hand-carved um, sculpture. But it, it is very neat. We're very um, you know, pleased that the Historical Society thought of us. And uh, we uh, are also proposing a donation agreement to go along with it since it's a piece of art that we would, we would be accepting. Are there questions from the board? Oh, there it is. Wow. Isn't that neat? And you can't tell from the picture how large it is. I wanna say it's like four feet across. Uh, Eric, just curious, is, was it, it wasn't in the detail there, I apologize, was it a local craftsman? Yeah, these were done by, um, I, I know, at least a couple local residents uh, who are um, members of the Board of the Historical Society. Yeah, I believe it was um, Bob, uh, Bob Moody and, um, oh my goodness, uh, mm -hmm. Joe Buddha, and I'm going to look up the name of the third person and I will get back to you with that. Beautiful, thank you. You're welcome. The third person is Rob, who, I don't know how to say his last name, P-O-U-T-A-S-S-E. Thanks, Melissa. We've recognized all three in the agreement, so it's in the, the packet. That's awesome. Okay. Is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to accept the art donation from the Simsbury Historical Society as required in the town gift policy, chapter 100 of the code of ordinances and to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the proposed donation agreement with the Simsbury Historical Society. So moved. Second, Mike. All in favor, with our thanks. All right. Hi, absolutely. Hi. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Item C uh, is a donation from the Valley Simsbury Church Neighbor Group. Is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to accept a donation from the Valley Simsbury Church Neighbor Group in the amount of $5,000 for the purpose of mm. supporting Simsbury community and social services 
department's food pantry, which assists residents in need. I'll make a motion with our thanks. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Big aye. <laughs> here, here. Item D is the um, fiscal year 22-23 Youth Service uh, Bureau Grant. Um, if we, yeah, I see Kristen, you're with us. Um, do you mind just giving us a brief summary? Sure. Hi, good evening. Um, this submission is for our application for the um, Youth Service Bureau Grant, which is administered by the Department of Children and Families for the state of Connecticut. Um, it is a biennial grant, so this um, application will take us through two years. And um, the amount that Simsbury will be receiving is 14186 in the regular grant program and $10,671 in the enhanced grant program. And all of those dollars go back towards our Simsbury youth in uh, programs and services. And there's also a town match that's required for this grant. And a portion of that is in-kind staff support. Um, other than that, there is not a fiscal um, requirement from the town. And um, we're really excited that we continue to be chosen for this grant. Um, it allows us as a department to provide some additional programs and services that we would not otherwise be able to. Um, and we're also really excited that we have a new teen librarian in town. Um, last year, we, we kind of struggled um, with COVID to spend all of our funding um, due to COVID, not meeting in person and um, not having our, our wonderful librarian. So we're really excited that she's here and we're already um, forming some new programs for the upcoming year. So we're, we're really looking forward to the work that we're going to do. Thanks, Kristen. Are there questions on this item? Okay, is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to approve submitting uh, applications for the Youth Service Bureau Grant and the Youth Service Bureau Enhanced Grant and authorize Maria Capriola, town manager, to execute the attached Youth Service Bureau and Enhanced Grant applications and further to uh, accept uh, the grant award um, should they be awarded. So moved. I'll second okay. it. I heard Chris on that one. Um, any further discussion? All in favor. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care. Item E is the Simsbury Public Library Emergency Connectivity Fund grant application. Um, so this is a, a neat opportunity, uh, Lisa, to expand on the library of things. Um, do you mind giving a, a summary of what this includes? Sure, absolutely. The uh, Emergency Connectivity Fund grant is actually part of the American Recovery Plan Act, um, and we thought this was a great opportunity to add some Wi-Fi hotspots to our library of things. The library currently has three Wi-Fi hotspots, and they are always checked out. And of course, during COVID, people needed hotspots more than ever with children doing remote learning. So we're planning to add 10 more Wi-Fi hotspots to the library of things. And we are currently seeking other funding to purchase laptops for people to also borrow. So this grant is for the Wi-Fi hotspots. Lisa, do you have any insight into why people are checking these out, like how they're using them? Um, I can tell you that my family uses them when we go on vacation to the Cape. Because okay. with three teenage girls, we can't be without Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, but I know that other people use them in town as well. Are there questions? Is there a motion effective uh, August 9th, 2021 to approve the library's application for emergency connectivity funds in the amount of $3,790 for 10 Wi-Fi hotspots, which will be available for borrowing with a valid Simsbury library card, and also to accept the emergency connectivity fund grant award and authorize uh, town manager Maria Capriola to execute all documents related to the award um, should we get it. So move. move that. Second. I heard Chris and then Mike. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Item F is the 2021 Simsbury Farms Ice Rink and Paddle Tennis Fee um, recommendations. So this fee schedule was recently approved by the Culture Parks and Rec Commission. Um, Tom Tversky, I understand that these are modest increases largely driven by the um, rise in the minimum wage. Yeah, uh, so that's certainly part of it, uh, Eric. <clears throat> um, we review the fees, as you know, we review the fees every year. We benchmark against 
um, the other rinks in the area as the, you know, the revenue fund, um, you know, ask us to do, I guess. And, and, and as you as oversight, we do, we do that on your behalf as well. Um, there have been price increases in the market and we're, you know, we're going to stay competitive with our facility, knowing that our facility doesn't have showers and some of the amenities that other uh, ice rinks in the area do have. But I, I think, you know, some of the, some of the fees haven't been touched in a few years. They're going to see a modest increase. Uh, we will, um, have some increases due to public skating, um, associated with public skating and the minimum wage. Um, we probably will dial back some of the ice time that's been allotted to public skating in the past few years. Um, <clears throat> the attendance has has gone down some over the last couple of years, um, but we're able to sell that ice time at a higher rate um, as well uh, to offset some, you know, the cost of doing business in the ring. So you're going to see uh, you know, still some public skating sessions offered, the holiday skates, vacations, things like that, but not um, three public skates a weekend like what was happening years ago. So we've made adjustments to the schedule. Other questions for Tom? Uh, yeah, Tom, I have a little question. Um, sure. So I, I was looking at the uh, projected additional revenues for the season pass family of four and the individuals, which is really nominal. Mm -hmm. And and I was going to just say, if, if you're saying you are going to dial back some of the ice time for them, should we really, I mean, I know it's nominal, but should we really increase the cost for the um, family of four pass? Yeah, so, some of those, Wendy, are people who bought, who come in the mornings for the morning skate. And okay. it does, we don't sell very many of those season passes, but the people who do buy them tend to, tend to utilize uh, the morning skates, which is at a lower rate because it's not, okay. it's not guarded and it, it does add up. So it's just a slight adjustment to, to, the, to the, basically to those people who buy a season pass to ex almost exclusively use it in the morning skate. Okay, I just wanted to just question that. Yep. Are there other questions? Okay, is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to approve the Culture Parks and Rec Department's uh, 2021 fee schedule for Simsbury Farms Ice Rink and Paddle Tennis programs as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Um, item Thanks, Tom. is um, a license agreement for the existing Meadowwood Agricultural Lease. Um, a little bit of context is that there's a, a farmer who currently is growing wheat and barley on the Meadowwood property. And in order uh, for that farmer to complete the 2021 growing season, um, we would need to approve this license agreement that's in our packet. And I believe. Um, do we have Bob with us? Yeah, Bob was just having a little bit of difficulty yeah. logging on. Um, so I can maybe start and uh, if you have additional questions, we can, we can have Bob elaborate further. Why don't you provide any context that I didn't to see if there are questions? Yeah, um, so again, you know, uh, the current um, farmer, um, as well as personally seeing the barn, obviously you know, have an interest in, in getting through essentially the growing season. Um, and we will be taking possession of the property most likely in September. Um, so it just leaves the small, you know, balance of October really and, and November. Um, and, you know, in terms of speaking with Bob about um, a license agreement versus a lease, um, he really felt that the license agreement um, was sort of the cleanest way of, um, you know, again, helping them sort of get through the remainder of, of their growing season so we wouldn't leave them hanging. Um, and we have not yet prepared um, that agreement as before. That's something that Bob will, will be working on for us. Great. And um, Bob DiCrescenzo, town attorney, is uh, joining as we speak. Um, Bob, just gave a very nice summary of the uh, agricultural lease item. Are there any questions from the board? Okay. I, I don't have any. Is there a motion effective? Um, August 9th, 2021, to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute a license agreement with OJ Thrall Inc. and John Baggett as a, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to form by the town attorney. I'll um, move that, Eric. I'll second it. I heard Chris and then Mike. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Um, item H is the Department of Transportation Master Municipal Agreement for Municipal Facilities Adjustments. I'm not going to say that twice. 
Um, Bob, did you want to uh, give a summary of um, what this item entails? Yes, this is a standard form agreement that DOT has been circulating all municipalities to streamline the reimbursement process for state projects when the municipality incurs costs associated with a state uh, project. Uh, I'm told by Jeff this is another one of, I think, three master agreements uh, dealing with DOT properties, and he's he's looked it over and uh, he, he's in favor of it. He does think it'll be a benefit to the town. I've reviewed it and there's nothing um, in it that is uh, detrimental to the town. And uh, you don't, state DOT does not give all 169 towns the opportunity to negotiate and change much in their master agreements. So um, uh, I recommend that the board approve it for the town manager's signature. Uh, I'm told by Jeff who's closest to the project that will speed up the reimbursement uh, from the state to the town for the costs incurred for the project that he cites in his, uh, his memo. Okay, thanks Bob, are there questions? Okay. Is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to authorize uh, town manager Maria Capriola to execute the master municipal agreement for readjustment, relocation and or removal of municipal facilities on highway projects? I'll move that. Okay. Oh, oh go ahead. Um, Wendy, were you gonna add something? No, I was gonna, I said that was a mouthful and then okay. Chris seconded it, so. Okay. All right, all in favor. Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Um, finally, uh, under selectman action, item I is um, a presentation from the ARPA work group. This is the American Recovery Plan Act. Um, and you know, you do a, a nice job in the presentation, Wendy, of um, setting up what this is. So I'll just turn it over to you. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa and Amy to start. Okay. I will take it first. Um, so I'm gonna run you through an overview of the program and then Wendy's gonna take you through um, what the work group discussions are. So if you wanna to flip to the next one, Melissa. So um, as previously reported, um, Sinsbury is expected to receive about 7.5 million in the ARPA funds um, related to the economic fallout from the pandemic. So we've already received the first half this past June, and we're expected to receive the second half um, June of 2022. So we can incur these funds by December 2024, and they have to be expended by December of 2026. Um, we already worked with the Board of Finance on setting up a special revenue fund to segregate um, this money. So it will not be commingled with the general fund. It'll be tracked completely separately. All of the investment um, income will be allocated to the fund. Um, in accordance with the guidance, we actually can keep the investment income and use it as we see fit. It does not have to be in accordance with um, ARPA eligibility requirements or guidelines, um, but the work group did express that they would like to see that interest income stay with the fund and be used for um, the intended purpose of the ARPA funds. Um, once um, the projects have been authorized, um, they will come to the Board of Selectmen for approval and then subsequently to the Board of Finance. The annual, re the annual re reporting will be due in October of each year. Um, it's federal money, but since we are not an entitlement community, um, it is passed through the state. So we will be doing our annual reporting to the state and it's basically just a listing of all of our projects, what we're spending the money on and then any of the documentation related to those projects. And then lastly, on this, on this slide, the expenditures must be tracked and meet guidance from the US Treasury. So tracking of grant money is something that you all are familiar with. And then the guidance from the US Treasury, they did come out with a document um, stating what our responsibilities are and um, how we need to track those responsibilities. So for example, um, grants for subrecipients, if we were to give um, this money to businesses or nonprofits, we actually are required um, to be the point of oversight. So they would actually need to submit to us how they're using their money. We would need to get documentation um, up front and on the annual reporting basis to make sure that they're spending their money within the intended purpose. And that's just one example. 
Um, moving on to the eligibility requirements. Um, so the guidance does come directly from the um, federal government, from the U.S. Department of Treasury. This is not something that's passed down to the state and then the state develops their own guidelines. These are the federal guidelines that we're using for, um, for our guidance. And then within the um, eligible categories, they've basically outlined four general areas of where they want us to spend money. Um, so the first one, as you can see here, is to actually to respond to the pandemic and then um, any negative economic impact um, that Sinsbury has had responding to that. So such things as um, vaccination campaigns, behavioral health care services, um, ventilation improvements, things of that nature. Another area um, is premium pay for those that um, work during the pandemic. That is something that is offered as part of, as part of these funds. Um, the next one is um, revenue loss. So basically um, a lot of communities um, have lost revenue during the pandemic, obviously, and um, they are allowed to go back and apply to get some of that revenue back. Unfortunately, Simsbury does not qualify for this based on the calculations that they provided that we have to meet. Um, so this is one that we will not be taking advantage of. And then the last item here is some infrastructure investments. So we can invest in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. Some of the things that we um, are not allowed to do, um, we're not allowed to rebuild our reserves. We're not allowed to um, deposit into any pension funds. We can't use it to offset our tax revenue. Um, we can't use it as matching funds for any other federal programs. And then the last item here where it says eligible uses for which Simsbury does not qualify, um, there, the revenue loss is listed there under the last, last line item, which I just talked about, and then the building stronger communities through investments. Um, so these would be like affordable housing projects. And in order to be considered for one of these types of projects, Simsbury would have to fall into what they define as a qualified census tract. And unfortunately, Simsbury does not fall into that qualified census tract. So we can't take advantage of that. And then lastly, under this maybe, um, so we would have to stay within the four categories, but if there's something within these categories that we wanna do that they didn't specifically state in the guidance, we have some flexibility there. We just have to keep these two things in mind when we're doing it. We need to specifically identify the need or the impact or the negative impact of COVID. And then we have to identify how the, prog how the program or the service um, is going to address that need or impact. And if we can come up with some supporting do documentation for these things, then likely we'd be able to move forward with that. And I believe that's it for me. Yep, on to Wendy. Okay, so first of all, I just wanna say when we've met three times and when Amy came in the first time, um, and Melissa and Sean and I met, she gave us a more detailed breakdown of the last few screens, which the, the ARPA team has um, as we go through the items. So I just wanted to point that out. And she also put in, you know, oh, you can't, you're not, you're not looking at me, so never mind. Um, so anyway, I just want to thank her. It was an inch thick and she talked to her Fed contact. So I feel like if we can follow her guidance, we should be on the right path. Um, the, the second thing that the, another thing that we did on the, the committee, the group, is to kind of do our due diligence to see if we had any capital projects on our CIP plan, either for this year or potentially in the next, in the six year plan or in CNR that we might be able to use the money for, um, justify it, like ventilation, um, things that fall under that, those categories. And then if we could use it for those items, you know, maybe we could, we could free up some space on the CIP or debt service. So Mel Melissa did her homework for us and did a lot of research and looking at all the items in some of the facilities master plan, the town facilities, the school, the town, um, looked at the CNR. She also looked at um, the six year plan and she, she even looked just to make sure we didn't miss anything, the items that we, that were removed from the six year CIP this year. So we could make sure that we're not, if we spend the money for other things, we're not skipping over things where we potentially should have spent the money is kind of how we were thinking. And 
we also talked about that this is kind of the concept um, we would bring to the board of finance to just get a little buy-in before we go down the path of you know, betterment for economic development or helping the community. If we had these capital projects that someone might say we should spend the money on to you know, lower debt service. So the only items um, that we really found that Melissa found were a couple items on the CNR that um, would, be, would qualify ventilation. And those would just free up, would those free up general fund money that we would use, Melissa? That's what we put for sources of fund. I think actually um, these two were flagged for Towny Road and then um, the sewer use fund would, would pay for the WPCA items. Um, but they're in the out years. Um, so at least with the, the highway item, it, it could it could change, um, you know, based on what we want to use Town Aid Road for. Um, so okay. they're, they're far, that one's far out on the plan. That okay, so, the, so one thing, if it was the general fund, that would just help us not use it, you know, taxpayer money for that. Um, and then the school facilities plan, there's a lot of air conditioning units that are coming, but these are all coming in, you know, in the next one to 10 years. They're not on the CIP on the six year plan currently. Um, so it would require using the money now for some of these items. And, um, you know, they may not be able to be decoupled from the projects that they're associated with. So we just wanted to present these as options where some of the money could be used, but there wouldn't be any immediate relief to our current um, CIP to either free up, you know, um, lower debt service or free up capacity. So basically this was doing our due diligence to kind of explore this as an option before we went to some of the more broader categories. If anybody has any questions on that, um, feel free to ask them or if they want to weigh in. Okay, this is what happens when you get to be the last presentation of the night. Um, so, so the team also met and Jackie has sat in as a public audience and uh, um, she has done a lot of homework on this too. And we took the priority areas um, that, you know, that um, Amy had mentioned and the ones that we feel that we want to focus on right now, we, we Kind of to premium pay off the list because it's so subjective and it covers so many different areas that we we feel that there's been some you know help given in those areas and also we feel that we should pay attention to the impact to the town for public health negative economic impact and potential infrastructure um so as you can see, there's no, we're not giving any magic bullets tonight that this is where we're going to use the money because we really don't know at this point in time. It's really early and this thing is really big. Um, there are towns out there that are saying, okay, we're taking our $5 million and we're doing this. And it might be that they have that on a capital plan or it's been on a wish list. But right now we're in the position of evaluating different projects that the town has put together that other people have requested um, potentially, and put them into these kind of breakdowns of areas. So, you know, broadband improvement, that's something that the downtown area um, has been bringing up quite a bit and is on one of the lists. So if we could do a study to see if there's any room for improvement down there. Um, another thing that we've been talking about is setting aside a lump sum, um, similar to what the Hartford Foundation for Giving did, but set up a lump sum where we allow our 501Cs and create an application process for them to come to us for specific grant funding to prove the impact they, the COVID has had on, on them. Um, and then the business economic recovery, we kind of talked about a little bit at the front of this, but you know, there's the facade improvements, there's multiple projects that have been thrown around and that are also on our sheet regarding how we can improve you know, the business communities, some of whom have been hard hit by the pandemic. And then getting into more Simsbury focused items, you know, one of the areas that we talk about is Terrafil. What can we do to put Terrafil more on the map potentially, you know, um, play up the Terrafil park because Terrafil, you know, that is where we do have some low income housing. And so there might be justification to spend money in that area. Um, and then of course, COVID is not over. So we don't know what's gonna happen with COVID and that this money can be used for that to public health crisis. So um, we can look to the Farmington Valley Health District for that. 
and one of the other things we did say was before we allot money elsewhere, we want to make sure someone's not, I'm not accusing anybody, but that there's no double dipping kind of thing. If people have access to funds from another, you know, relief source, then, you know, our funds might be better used somewhere else. Um, I don't know, anybody want to weigh in? Any insights on this? I don't know if Jackie wants to provide any commentary here, but I'm just going to open it up here before I go on. I'm in agreement, um, Wendy. These We did go over these ideas, and I think this is just our first um, preview, yep. right, yep. if that's fair yep. to say? It is. And so this is where we're trying to start, and we can filter down from here. Okay. Yeah, it's just I keep saying this, and I'll just show you when you see our next steps. There's a lot of next steps. Yeah. So, I, Melissa, I think you could move move over. Um, so one of the uh, items that we have been talking about is, um, so we have our work group of two with the town staff, and we want to bring on advisors, people who are more knowledgeable, who might have input to help us develop a plan. And these are all the groups that we've put on the table um, because we haven't named people specifically because not everybody knows that we might ask them. Um, there, are, there are a few people that we we've, have expressed interest. I know um, Lisa and Rob on the Board of Finance have some interest and Sarah Nielsen obviously has a, um, a big interest in how we work with the economic development. And then one of the other items that we put out here too was to at some point reach out to the public um, potentially in the zip codes either to present some of what we found or where we're going just to make sure we get buy-in from our residents because the money really is here to benefit everybody and you know whether it's just to you know show them what we've done or what we're doing we just feel like that's going to be a necessary piece at the end so we could move on um, so this was the biggest thing that I think we decided when we all sat down for the first time because I asked everybody, are we in any hurry to use this money? You know, and it, it, the resounding answer was no. All four of us said no. We have until 2024 to actually designate it for use. And we're going to get, we already got three and a half million dollars now that we can start looking at. And we're going to get another three and a half million dollars next year. And we don't have to use it till the year after that. So that was just a kind of a calming thing, I think, for all of us. It was for me. I don't know about Amy and Melissa. Um, so we're presenting to uh, us tonight. Um, the plan is to present to the Board of Finance just to make sure we get a, some buy-in from them on the capital uses and the direction that we're going to go. So we don't, you know, we don't get later on find out that we went down a path that we weren't gonna get um, support for. And actually our next steps are really to figure out what we're gonna do is like, what's the process? What's the framework? Um, we're gonna listen to Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance direction. So anybody here can reach out to us um, with ideas. And then another piece of this is name and engage the stakeholders that are um, to, to be named. Um, and if we are going to use money for any of the capital projects, or any CNR projects, we would like to decide that sooner so that when we go to the 22-23 budget session, we kind of know what we're gonna do with that money, if we're gonna have less spending in an area or more spending in an area. And just to, to finish up, there's, we can, you know, how to process all this, I don't have an answer, but there's a lot of ways of, you know, getting all these ideas together that are valid and either creating some sort of ranking system, you know, we can develop that to see, you know, what's the most important to the most people, what's the most bang for the buck, what's going to pass through the feds with flying color, um, those kind of things. And then, um, you know, and also create an application of some sort for the 501Cs once we decide how much and how and who qualifies for that. And then the last thing is to stay tuned to what's going on with the um, infrastructure bill, which is um, on its way to be passed, because we there may be money coming from that. And also to just see if there's any tweaking to the um, interim final rule when it becomes the real final rule, 
So, so those are kind of the things that we need to keep our eyes on. And there is an attachment in here. There's a reference to something that I think is really valuable to read that um, CCM put together an advisory group. It's, it's this toolkit. And it's made up of a lot of board of selectmen, um, so people from GFOA, people from CCM, probably a lot of organizations that you professionals deal with. And they all weigh in and there's a huge list of resources and names. And I believe that we could use them if we need to for you know, advice or opinions on something where we may question it, you know, just as a place to go to as even a consultant if we find that you know, they provide value. So that's where we are. And I guess we'll have a meeting scheduled soon, Melissa. Um, and I don't know, a few questions or just wanna digest it. Well, I, I just really appreciate this approach. I think that there's a very human tendency to wanna to jump to the fun part of start writing checks and assigning projects. And I think that the way you're thinking about this is absolutely right starting with the, the wide funnel and then narrowing it down to specific projects. So I'm, I'm very much on board with the approach. I've got, a, thank, uh, I've got a question for Amy, I think. Amy, if you go back to one of your initial slides, um, the do's and don'ts, the filter, uh, I think there was one of them that there was said federal can't be used for projects that are receiving federal funds from another uh, program. Um, is yeah, so if we're getting Amy? yeah, if we're if we're getting federal funds um, where it requires a match, we cannot use these funds as our match. We have to okay. So it's not so that's key there. So if it, if they require a match, but if you're getting federal funds for um, flat out, let's just say, then you could put additional monies towards that event or that project. So I'm thinking specifically of. Um, the yes pack um with we know that the shuttered venue uh, monies which is a federal fund i think it's a, that's federal money is going towards that project that's something that would to me just 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 sort of blue skying the concept um it, an organization that was affected by the pandemic lost revenue health and wealth health and welfare component of that it's a nonprofit to a certain extent, it's the health and welfare of the of um, the community. And we know that down the road where there's CNR possibly or uh, projects to be looked at for investing in that, whether it be the handicap access for the parking lot, accessibility, whether, so that's something to me is very interesting. I think if we could view that, um, get some more detail on applicability in that area. Yeah, that's a good point too, Chris. And when um, Senator Blumenthal was here, remember he, he told Linda that there might be more um, shuttered venue money available, but that if we did have questions on use, his office would also be happy to answer questions related to that. So, um, you know, keeping an eye on the pack, I think is a good thing. Right. Other questions for um, uh, Wendy or uh, Amy or Melissa? Again, I'm th so thankful for the work that this group has done and um, look forward to engaging the community more broadly in next steps. Yeah, thanks guys, impressive. We have appointments and resignations. Um, several, uh, so we're gonna start with the Performing Arts Center Board of Directors. Is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to retroactively reappoint Linda Schofield and Catherine Bernard to the uh, Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center Board of Directors with terms expiring January 31st, 2021 and expiring January 31st, uh, 2024. Um, and also to appoint uh, Ping Shea to the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center Board of Directors with the term expiring January 31, 2023. And finally, to appoint Chris Barnett to the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center Board of Directors with the term expiring January 31st, 2022. Oh, I'll move that. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.
Item uh, B, uh, Culture, Parks and Rec. Is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to appoint uh, Timothy Walzak as a regular member of the Culture, Parks and Rec Commission with a term expiring January 1, 2022? I'll move that. So, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item uh, C. Uh, is an uh, appointment to the Conservation Commission. Is there a motion effective August 9, 2021 to appoint Jason Berman as a regular member of the Conservation Commission in the Wetlands and Water Force Agency with the term ending January 1, 2024? I'll move that. I'll second it. Second. Heard Wendy. All in favor? Aye. 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 And is there a motion effective August 9th, 2021 to accept the resignation of Andrew Walter as a regular member of the Public Building Committee retroactive to June 25th, 2021? I'll move that with our thanks. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, review of minutes, uh, three sets of minutes. Uh, from the regular meeting on July 12th and special meetings on July 15th and 28th. Um, were there any changes that anyone saw? Okay, then those will stand. Are there any small committees on and subcommittee reports tonight? I have a, I have a quick update. Um, I just wanted to check in with the Board of Ed about the, the masks for school. Um, and what I know is that, you know, Lamont's executive order still stands through the end of September for mask wearing. And I, they still have not made any kind of decision at his level, but that there is a special board of ed meeting on 824 that I believe will be at the program room of the library. That's it. Okay, thanks Wendy. Other updates tonight? Anything under communication that anyone wanted to raise? Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Well, I'll second it. Don't all go at once. Um, I, Bye. I don't even know who I heard. I think Chris, I heard Chris, and then, Chris and I second. Okay, that works for me. Um, all in favor? Bye. 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 Okay, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Everyone.